Hello, Telesur English presents a new episode of China Now, a way media's production that showcases the culture, technology, and politics of the Asian giant. In our first segment, Corrence Chris Yan goes over the visit of U.S. Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimondo to China and the underbelly of her state in the nation as well as China's new economic strategies to cope with global inflation rights. Let's see. China Current is a weekly news talk show from China to the world. We cover viral news about China every week and also give you the newest updates on China's cutting-edge technologies. Let's get started. Hi, welcome to China Currents, I'm Chris. Last week, on August 27th, U.S. Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimondo arrived in Beijing, commencing a four-day visit to China. She was the fourth senior U.S. government official to visit China since June, following Secretary of State Anton Blinken, Secretary of Treasury Janet Yellen, and U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate John Kerry. Her visit includes stops in Beijing and Shanghai, where she held discussions with Chinese government officials and meeting with American companies operating in China, which, by the way, was highlighted by her visit to the Shanghai Disneyland. Raimondo is in charge of the economic and trade sectors that are of mutual interest to China and the United States. Additionally, her portfolio covers the area of technology exports, which is a focal point in Sino-American relations due to U.S. exports controls. Consequently, Raimondo's visit to China has garnered significant international attention with anticipation expressed by media outlets all over the world. On August 28th, U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo met with China's Minister of Commerce Wang Wentao in Beijing. Before Raimondo's visit, the U.S. Commerce Department announced it had lifted 27 Chinese entities out of the so-called unverified list, which restricts the entities to access exports from the U.S. China and the U.S. agreed to set up a working group to enable officials and business representatives on both sides to find solutions on trade and investment issues and to advance U.S. commercial interests in China. The group will meet twice a year starting in early 2024. And Gina Raimondo said Monday that it is profoundly important for China and the U.S. to have a stable economic relationship. China remains America's third largest export market buying more than $150 billion of products from U.S. farms and businesses. Exports to China support more than 80,000 jobs in the United States and benefit small as well as large firms. Following her meeting with Chinese Minister of Commerce on August 29th, Gina Raimondo met with Chinese Premier Li Qiang in Beijing. The meeting aimed to foster enhanced cooperation between the two economic powerhouses. Premier Li emphasized the mutually beneficial and win-win nature of China-U.S. economic and trade relations. He noted that China, as the largest developing country, and the United States, as the largest developed country, should focus on strengthening mutually beneficial cooperation. He warned against the politicization of these issues and the overstretching of security concepts, stating that such actions could adversely affect bilateral relations and even have a disastrous impact on the global economy. Premier Li also expressed China's willingness to engage in more practical and beneficial actions to maintain and develop bilateral relations. On the U.S. side, Secretary Raimondo clarified that the U.S. had no intention of containing China's development or decoupling from it and expressed the U.S. willingness to maintain communication and normal economic and trade relations with China. Chinese exports have emphasized that maintaining a stable economic and trade relationship between China and the United States is crucial for not only both countries but also the entire world. The meeting comes at a crucial time when both countries are navigating complex economic and geopolitical landscapes, and it signifies a mutual desire to reset and strengthen bilateral relations. Experts stress the importance of tangible actions to achieve this goal as a stable relationship between the two economic giants has far-reaching implications. Most of Chinese netizens and social media welcomed the visit of high-level U.S. officials expecting Sino-U.S. cooperation to promote the development of the global economy. However, they also consider the U.S. move paradoxical. Normally, when you have four high-ranking officials from the United States visiting in three-month span, 
That means the U.S. is really trying to improve and stabilize the bilateral relation. That said, what we see is the United States trying its best to contain China in every way. Karen stick, that's what it is. Whenever China asks the White House when it, whether it wants to decouple and sabotage the relations, the Americans send officials to Beijing and be like, dude, take it easy, we'll be friends, can you buy more bonds? But as soon as the politicians are back in DC, oh boy, they'll be like animals back in the wild forest and starting to spread all those cold, warish, and anti-socialist stuff all over again. A dumping ground for commodities and a scapegoat. That's what the US wants China to be. Economically, the states needs China to absorb, in other words, to buy all the stuff it manufactures, and politically, politicians and power brokers in DC need China to become the new villain so that, first, the military-industrial complex can advocate for more budget, and second, they can act a lot more American by being aggressive towards China and get your vote. Next up, let's turn to the Chinese economy. According to the Ministry of Finance and State Taxation Administration, the securities transaction stamp tax will be reduced by half starting from August 28th. The purpose of the policy is to invigorate the capital market and boost investor confidence, marking the second reduction of securities transaction stamp tax in 15 years. The securities transaction stamp tax can be regarded as a significant tool used by regulatory authorities to manage the market. Currently, the stamp tax rate for stock transactions in China is 0.1 per mil. Following this adjustment, the rate will be lower to 0.05 per mil, maintaining a unidirectional imposition. Data indicates that there are over 220 million individual investors in the Chinese stock market, constituting 99.8% of the entire investor base. Experts suggest that in terms of the impact of the tax policy, lowering the securities transaction stamp tax rate is beneficial for reducing transaction costs, lightening the burden on a vast number of investors, and reflecting a policy direction focused on tax reduction, fee reduction, benefits to the public, and people's welfare. The move is expected to stimulate trading activity and attract more participation in the stock market by making investment more appealing to a wide range of individual investors. The decision aligns with broader economic goals of promoting economic growth and stability through targeted tax measures. Next up, on September 1st, several nationwide commercial banks in China lowered their deposit benchmark interest rate. It's the second reduction in deposit interest rate in less than three months. Interest rate for one year, two year, and three year fixed deposit will be lowered by 0.1%, 0.2%, and 0.25% accordingly. The reduction has been interpreted by many netizens as a policy to stimulate consumption. A portion of public sentiment shifted the focus toward the government, believing it was pressuring the citizens to exhaust their bank accounts. Yet many still maintain an optimistic outlook for the follow-up policies. After reduction, existing mortgage rate will be over 2% higher than deposit interest rate, only pushing the depositors to repay the existing loans instead of consumption. If the government aims to stimulate the economy, this reduction will lead to, correspondingly, a mortgage rate drop in the following days, which will be a relief for many borrowers. And this was not the only new policy. The People's Bank of China also announced on September 1st that to enhance the ability of financial institutions to utilize foreign exchanges, it would cut the foreign exchange reserve requirement ratio by two percentage points, from 6% to 4% starting September 15th. After the announcement, the offshore exchange rate of the RMB against dollar strengthened, reaching 7.2391 before slightly retreated. Analysts suggest the policy can help onshore dollar liquidity and ease the downward pressure on the yuan, further stabilize the yuan. Many Chinese economists also share the opinion the foreign exchange reserve requirement ratio mobilized more than tens of billions of dollars, but that holds limited influence to the market, one expert stated. But the message is clear. PBOC is determined to defend yuan with future policies. Some economists predict that since U.S. rate hiking cycle is ending, yuan will slightly appreciate by the end of this year. Besides changes in the foreign exchange reserves, PBOC announced a new policy in the real estate market as well. In a major policy shift, the People's Bank of China and the National Financial Supervision Administration Bureau have decided to optimize the differential housing credit policy across the country. 
A key aspect of these adjustments is the unification of the minimum down payment ratio policy for commercial individual housing loans. The policy will no longer differentiate between cities implementing purchasing restrictions and those that do not. The minimum down payment ratio for first and second commercial individual housing loans have been uniformly set to no less than 20% and 30% respectively. One might wonder why there is a need to lower the interest rate on existing first home loans. According to officials from the Central Bank and the National Financial Supervision Administration Bureau, China's real estate market has seen significant changes in supply and demand in recent years. Both borrowers and banks have expressed a need for orderly adjustment and optimization of assets and liabilities. The reduction in the interest rate on existing housing loans benefits borrowers by saving on interest expenses, thereby promoting expansion in consumption and investment. For banks, this can effectively reduce the occurrence of early loan repayments, alleviating the impact on bank interest income. At the same time, it can also curtail the misuse of business loans and consumer loans to replace existing housing loans, reducing potential risks. Last but not least, let's take a look at COVID. The General Customs Administration of China has announced that starting from August 30th, foreign travelers will no longer be required to take COVID-19 testing before entering mainland China. This decision marks the lifting of the last entry requirement related to the global pandemic. In the last eight months, the reopening has had a positive impact on the domestic tourism sector, which has rebounded to nearly 90% of its pre-COVID levels. Encouragingly, there are also signs of outbound tourism picking up. China's National Immigration Administration reported a total of 168 million arrivals and departures from mainland in the first half of this year, indicating a gradual recovery in travel activities. However, despite these positive trends, the South China Morning Post highlights that the number still falls short of those recorded in 2019. Tourism ministry analysts attribute this disparity to a key factor, a shortage of international flights. As of April 2023, international airline seat capacity had only recovered to around 37% of pre-COVID levels, as reported by consultancy firm McKinsey. Well, that's all for today. Thank you for watching this episode of China Currents. If you have any thoughts and comments about our show, please reach us at the email address below. I'm Chris, looking forward to hearing from you, and see you next time. We will go for a short break now, but we'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back to China Now. In this second segment, third holds uh, Lisa Pan explores the environmental impact of Japan's dumping of wastewater from the Fukushima power plant into the ocean. And in the Thinkers Forum, experts analyze Russia's resources, possible alliances, and its role in the current geopolitical scenario. Enjoy it. Question Which is more harmful to the oceans? The United States nuclear tests in the Pacific or Japan's discharge of nuclear contaminant water. Fukushima nuclear plant. Fukushima water. Controversial radioactive water. Controversial release of treated radioactive water. Japan has begun releasing million tons of wastewater from the Fukushima into the Pacific. On August 24th, Japan began releasing tons of radioactive water from the crippled Fukushima nuclear plant into the ocean. It raised concerns and China has reacted strongly against Japan's action. The plan is, uh, is safe from a technical and a scientific point of view, and there are uh, many equivalent situations that happen around the world. It does sound like a bad thing to do, but it's actually very safe. Japan's official has compared Fukushima's tritium emission to those from other nuclear plants worldwide. But are they really the same? After all, the Fukushima plant did experience the worst nuclear accident since Chernobyl in 2011. So what is the difference? The primary function of a nuclear plant involves circulating water that absorbs heat from the nuclear reactor, converting it into steam and drive turbines and generate electricity. The resulting vapor is then cooled by seawater in a separate loop. 
which transforms it back into liquid water. The wastewater discharge is mainly the seawater used for cooling, which is separate from the nuclear material in the reactor. However, at the Fukushima plant, the cooling water is mixed with the hypoxic material because the reactors are damaged. On top of this, there is about 100 tons of groundwater and rainwater which leaks into the reactor every day, and they are also contaminated. So these water contains not only a large amount of tritium, but also over 60 other radioactive substances including carbon-14, which is used for radiocarbon dating, but is also dangerous if ingested and can concentrate in the food chain. Cesium-137, which causes soft tissue cancer, strontium-90, which causes bone cancer and leukemia, and then there's tritium. They can get rid of the vast, vast majority of these other elements, but tritium... So how does this process go? The Advanced Liquid Processing System is a key facility for treating nuclear contaminated water. It is like an oversized water filter. Ideally, it would be able to treat all radioactive materials except tritium to bring their concentration up to standard, like Japan said. But there are doubts. I think the most useful independent assessment has been conducted by several uh, very well-regarded international scientists in a scientific independent expert panel commissioned by the Pacific Islands Forum, who engaged in detail with the Japanese government, with TEPCO, with the IAEA, make it clear that we really don't know exactly what's in all of those tanks. Uh, it's likely very different in different tanks. We really don't know how effectively the ALPS water purification system will work to remove those many radionuclides other than tritium. え、トリチウム水というと入っているのはトリチウムだけだよと勘違いしてしまうんです。非常に悪質なプロパガンダと言えます。そもそもごく微量しか含まれていないんですと決めつけて測定しない、測定していない放射性物質もある。170近い放射
we've seen an inadequate radiological ecological impact assessment. That makes us very concerned that Japan would not only be unable to detect what's getting into the water, sediment and organisms, but if it does, there is no causes to remove it. There is no way to get the genie back in the bottle. An article in Nature challenges the concept of dilution as a solution to nuclear pollution. These substances may be diluted in seawater, but it may also increase the concentration through bioaccumulation in the marine food chain. As larger fish eat smaller fish, heavy isotopes can accumulate. The safety of the water in Fukushima depends on the authenticity of the data and the feasibility of implementing theoretical plans, the effectiveness and monitoring of the 30 to 50 years discharge, and whether the Japanese government and TEPCO can deliver on their promises. But even the Japanese are skeptical. A survey conducted by the Asahi Shimbun in August revealed that only 53% supported the plan, while 41% opposed it. There have been large-scale protests in South Korea, and other Pacific countries also do not support the plan. Despite the verbal support from the US government for the ocean discharge, they have reduced their imports of Japanese agricultural and aquatic products in the first half of this year. The reactors have not been fully stocked, and the TEPCO currently does not know the whereabouts of the melted fuel cores, nor do they have any plans to extract the reactors. This means that, theoretically, there is an infinite amount of nuclear contaminated water, and this is only the beginning. And that is all for today's Threshold. I think there are three points playing into why the US is choosing to push Russia and China together. Um, it's not like they want this to happen. It's just, in their opinion, from their view, their best strategic choice. The first thing is, on one hand, um, Russia has infinite resources and all countries want them. Russia is an infinite resource tank. Anything you want, Russia probably has it somewhere lying around in its massive territory. So everybody wants to trade with Russia. On the other hand, it's also a nuclear power. So you cannot just take those resources because you will get nuked. You cannot invade, realistically invade and take over parts of Russia. Russia will literally destroy you and everyone on this planet if you try. Um, so the only country that does have a realistic choice of ever conquering, invading parts of Russia uh, is China itself, another nuclear power that is bordering Russia and could send troops right over, take parts of Siberia, whatever. But China is also the most peaceful country on earth. So the US knows China would not attack Russia without being attacked by Russia first or being forced in any other way by Russia to attack. Um, so the US has, in my personal opinion, already acknowledged that they cannot reasonably control or make use of Russian resources. They can only stop the flow of Russian resources to other nations. Um, and the reality when it comes to stopping those flows to other nations is that they can never stop the flows to China because Russia and China share small land border and uh, they can definitely always train and will defend that uh, border against foreign intervention. When you look at this, Russia is a big resource basket. What are the options? Either you f keep friendly terms with China and keep um, Russia and China apart, but then Russia will do everything it can to make peace and sell to Europe. So the better choice from the, U Russia, uh, from the US perspective is actually to choose to continue its vassalization of Europe, which will forced Russia to sell to China. The US will never be able to, to control both sides. Either Russia will sell to Europe or Russia will ch sell to China. These are the options and uh, the US cannot control both sides. So the US has decided it will, rather than to try and control everybody, they will focus on controlling Europe 
and split the world into east and west to make sure that the resource flows to the west stop and the, uh, Russia is forced to sell to the east. I think this is just the US cutting its strategic losses and saying um, Russia and China uh, are a better match than Europe and Russia because George Friedman predicted all the way, I think in 2007 or so, Europe is destined for conflict. And uh, the most important strategic objective of the United States in Europe is to split Russia and Germany apart because a unison of German uh, political control in Europe, as well as uh, uh, know-how and manufacturing base um, matched with Russian resources, uh, such an alliance would be an even bigger threat to uh, US domination of the world than just the rising China. So I believe this is just US cutting its losses, deciding Russia-China alliance is preferable over EU-Russia alliance. Um, and I think what plays into this is that uh, Russia is a capitalist, highly religious country with highly conservative people um, that, that have a very strong national identity. On the other hand, you have China, which is a socialist country, very atheistic, non-religious, uh, at the very least its government. And of course, they are racially, culturally, ethnically different. Um, so the U.S. probably thinks it's easier to split Russia and China at a later date apart than it will be to split Europe and Russia apart if they ever form an alliance. Because Europeans are ethnically, racially, culturally more aligned with Russia um, than the Chinese. So I think this is, this is why the U.S. is choosing to allow Russia and China to come together. <laughs> I think what we need to do is take a deep breath and really kind of look back in history and when this whole conflict unfolded. And we have to even go back further than if we're going to discuss about the Ukraine and Russian conflict right now, we have to go back to the fall of the Soviet Union to understand how most of these countries got in this situation, why most of these countries are still in a conflict today. You see, there's been a lot of focus on the Ukraine, its borders, its territory. We hear things like sovereignty, Ukraine sovereignty. What really is that? If it's about sovereignty and it's about Ukraine trying to protect, protect its borders, then you have to ask yourself then why in 2014 did its own army, its own army, fire on its own civilians. Yes, that did happen. That was a fact. And that remains a fact today. And this is a narrative that the Western media has ignored because it was a failed attempt. Of course, they did remove the sitting president of the Ukraine at that time. But today, we still do not see uh, back in 2014 and 15, an election that took place that brought a new one in because, well, the American government decided Ukraine's future for them. So is this conflict with Ukraine and Russia? I'd have to say it's a proxy war. If we look and try to understand why these conflicts are going on and why these, we'll call it civilians, are rising up against governments, it's for a very clear reason, because when the Soviet Union collapsed, a lot of people were displaced. And to understand that, you have to understand the geography. Now, maps, maps will always be rewritten for years, okay? Into the future, there will be more territory taken by another nation or another country, but that's how conflicts are settled. But if we look into this situation, this is about a country that is protecting its citizens or th ethnicity of these individuals, even though they're on the outside borders of their country. And let me give you some numbers to think about. The Baltic states, NATO members, okay. The Baltics have several ethnics, um, but one of them is Russian, 33% in Latvia, 
25.4% in, uh, let's say, the Lithuania, and over 30%, almost 900,000 in total in the Baltic states alone, or ethnic-speaking Russians. Now, I'm going to add something on to that. Estonia is a good example of potentially another country that could definitely get involved in this situation very quickly. Estonia, till this day, 10% of their population are living stateless in their country. Now, you may say, Alex, what does that mean? They're Estonian, uh, they're Estonian uh, citizens. Actually, they're not. They are Russians that still believe that they want to keep their ethnics. They could be a grandmother or an uncle or a brother that, let's say, was living in Estonia after the fall of the Soviet Union. Still Russian, but according to Estonia, you're not. Because by the laws that have gone down in Estonia, which are human rights uh, laws that you should really look into, if you look into the details, these people are stateless. And in fact, the Estonian government is so polite in their humiliation that they've given them gray passports, alien passports on the cover. Now, this is an unresolved issue. What does a gray passport mean? That means, well, you can stay in Estonia. You can work in Estonia. You can kind of travel around Europe. You can't get any of the European unit benefits but we'll let you stay and we'll humiliate you until you give up that Russian passport. What's that mean? It's in the laws in Estonia. It's on the books of the laws in Latvia. It's in the laws of Lithuania. No dual nationality. So the choice for these ethnic speaking Russians are very clear. Forget about your past. Forget about your language. Train yourself to understand a new language. And then, and only then, we will make you a citizen. But whatever passport or family that you had that you want to keep in touch with, well, we're going to have to sever those ties from a passport or a citizen angle, and you'll be a proud Estonian. But yet, you won't have that access to the motherland, maybe where you were born. And we wonder why people are rising up and fighting for this. This modern day, I don't know the right word for it, but I'd have to say it's a cleansing of some sort sponsored by the European Union. And we may think that this is just isolated in Estonia, but oh, no, no, no. This happened in Transnistria. I bet you most of the people watching this program today have probably never even heard of Transnistria. This was a conflict also that happened in uh, 1990 and lasted for almost two years. Kind of sounds familiar, right? <sighs> Thousands of people have died in Transnistria because they were ethnic Russians being forced to become part of the Republic of Moldova. They said no. And to this day, to 2023, for over 20 years since the fall, these people have got their own passport, their own currency, their own identity, and they refuse to be told to give up their culture, their livelihood, their connection to the motherland. And that place borders, get this, this, the Ukraine, and Moldova, the doorstep to Europe. Where are the diplomats in Europe that want this to end? They don't. Does America want this to slow down, wind down? The Americans are not in control at this time. The Russians control at this time, and they will decide where this ends. If we fast forward to the situation where we're in now, watching this conflict myself, 
watching independent crowdfunded journalists like Patrick Lancaster, who originally got me in to this type of content, geopolitical stuff. I couldn't find any answers on the other side of the Donbass area, except from one man, and that was Patrick Lancaster. And at the time, Patrick was the first guy I ever heard of in 2015 where I've ever heard the thing, the term called demonetized. I said, what does that mean, Patrick? He says, well, Silicon Valley, the big names, they don't want me to put my message out. I thought that was a bit strange. Weeks later, he said, PayPal has disabled my account. I thought, wow. This is interesting. The more I heard, the more that he was being silenced, the more I wanted to go down there and meet him. Eventually, I did. He was one of the first people first I ever donated to because I was tired of seeing the narrative on the Western media. My wife is Lithuanian. She speaks Russian. Her father was from Belarus. This is a culture, and these people are connected in many ways to Russia. Whatever crazy mandate the Americans, these NATO-led countries have on trying to cleanse these European countries of Russia, well, <laughs> Judgment Day is here. The country of Russia that has 6,500 or 6,257 nuclear warheads is going to stand up for itself at any cost. They've seen pipelines bombed. Their downtown areas, desperation drone attacks in the center of Moscow. How crazy can America get to lead this? We've seen the conflict drag into its second year. The Americans have donated 8,500 javelins, 1,155 millimeter howitzers, 50 howitzers, 100,000 mortar shells, 38 multiple rocket launcher HIMARS, 109 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles. They trained 15,000 soldiers. The list goes on and on and on. France, 550 million military aid and growing. Training of Ukraine soldiers. Anti-tank missiles. Two LRU type multi-rocket launchers. Germany. 14 Leopard 2 tanks, Patriot Air Defense Systems, 500 Stingers, the list goes on, a large number of armored vehicle weapons, Spain, 6.7 million rifles and pistols, incredible list of artillery, killing machine artillery, we call it, or as Lindsey Graham says, to the last Ukraine, and you know, there was a question asked earlier in this program of how many casualties. When I heard the term, our tank got stuck because there were so many casualties we couldn't drive over them. That is a very sobering thing to hear from somebody that is reporting from that area. If America has not learned from its failed attempt in the Yugoslavian war that broke up the Yugoslavia in 78 days of aerial bombardment of that country. NATO led, by the way, my oh my, these next few months are going to be a sobering reminder that conflicts don't end by pumping more artillery into Ukraine. It's done by diplomacy, and that's the only way out of this mess. And this was another episode of China Now, a show that opens a window to the present and the future of the Asian giant. Hope you enjoy it. See you next time.